a workout. I just rode my bike 967 miles. Yeah, a new world record. And no big deal. You should have seen it though. I, I really, I could have gone longer, but it, it, all it did was get me thinking. Whatever happened to bikes and Pokemon? Bicycles were the premier mode of transportation since the beginning. Though, Gen 6 onwards, they've been slowly phased out and replaced with ride Pokemon. I get that riding around on a go goat or whatever is significantly more exciting, but there's just something special about steering that million Poke Dollar bike from red and blue. I am glad that Sword and Shield returned to old reliable. And I'm glad the Paldean locals used them to traverse the region's expansive landscape. Good to see the youngsters returning to their roots. Uh, oh, oh wait. Mm. That's a Pokemon, isn't it? Uh, Game Freak's running out of ideas. I bet next gen they'll make a literal car. Wait, they didn't what? Really though, it's odd that the locals just looked at a lizard and said, yep, that looks like a bike to me, and started riding around on it. I guess when you evolve a bike racing helmet and a pair of mountain bike tires, you're bound to be mistaken from time to time. They've named it after this misidentification too, as Cyclozar is a combination of cycle, as in bicycle, and lizard, a fitting name. As its Pokedex claims, it can sprint at over 70 miles an hour while carrying a human. And apparently, Cyclozar has been allowing people to ride on its back since ancient times. Depictions of this have been found in 10,000 year old murals. So I guess old habits die hard. It honestly kind of reminds me of Accelerate from Ben 10, but green and a little more animalistic instead. It's a dragon normal type, the second in the franchise with this combination. It's probably this type due to its abundance around the region, and so they've become very accustomed to human life, and they've become just normal. No more big, scary, sharp teeth or other feral tendencies. It's basically a glorified house cat that drives you to work now. I do question why they would stick with a Cyclozar over a river room, though. Sure, its base speed is higher, but you wouldn't know that at first glance. I suppose since Scarlet and Violet are truly the first open-world Pokémon games with loads of mountains and caves, it would be challenging for any four-wheeled vehicle to travel those. Plus, since the region's based on Portugal and Spain, countries known for their small and walkable cities, try driving your F966 down those Los Platos streets. It's not like they can fly- uh oh. Well, you do your own thing. Well, at least this one's cuter and better for the environment. <sighs> All right, I gave up the family car for this thing. It uh, sure has some growing pains, but it'll all be worth it so that my grandchildren can have a future. All I need to do is uh, find the gas cap. Uh, where's the gas cap? Nope, empathy is overrated. I'm getting a car call instead. Now, as many will point out, these are not actually wheels, which is why Cyclozar uses its legs to run around instead. Rather, these parts are inspired by body parts from real life lizards. Starting with the rear, it's a back tire, but various species of chameleon possess prehensile tails which are capable of curling just like human fingers. And since these lizards spend most of their time living in trees, the threat of falling to an untimely death is always present, so it always helps to have an extra line of support. So they wrap their tails around tree branches to provide extra safety. But Cyclozar repurposes this tail in, admittedly, a much less useful way, but aesthetically pleasing nonetheless. And I love how its ability Shed Tail is both like how many lizards detach their tails to escape from predators, and it's also like replacing a tire. However, chameleons are not one of the lizards that can do that. But here's another chameleon element it borrows, that head crest. On top of being a simple head crest, it also doubles nicely as a racing bike helmet, or a windshield, while also being a reference to, perhaps, Central America's helmeted lizards. And those orange cheek pouches, while also on many species of lizards, here they also resemble little turn signals even if they don't function as such. And just like its tail, that front tire isn't a tire either. It's a dewlap, which are folds of loose skin below the lower jaw on various species. Basically, they're the double chins of the animal kingdom, and lizards have some of the most extravagant dewlaps of them all. The most iconic of these belong to the Anoli, who purposes theirs for courtship and intimidation purposes, leading to some beautiful and exquisite displays of color. The fan-throated lizard in particular is where Korodon's color scheme comes 
comes from, but these throat patches don't just expand themselves. Just like tires, anoles inflate them. Which may be one of the biggest reasons why they made a bike lizard Pokemon in the first place. But you know what? I just can't get over the fact that it also kind of resembles a fighter jet helmet. The throat pouch looks kind of like a breathing tube, especially when you treat the white portion as negative space. And those cheek pouches then also double as the buttons pilots press to lower their visor. But neither Cyclozar or chameleons ever deal with air travel. However, obviously, the legendaries do glide around with wings, and Miraidon even gets jet boosters for feet, so maybe. Both chameleons and anoles can be found in the Iberian Peninsula, and the Mediterranean chameleon is the only chameleon found there, and while the brown and night anole can be found there, neither are native to the area, only popping up in the early 2010s through escaped pets. But the hot and rocky climate of Iberia is extremely friendly to these cold-blooded lizards, so populations have been on the rise ever since their introduction, hence also why there are so many other lizards that are native to the area. Mostly just generic lizards, though. But generic or not, lizards are well known for basking in the sun, and then rapidly skittering about and running away real fast. Some are even fast enough to run across water. But speaking of speed and going fast, that about does it for this rather speedy video. Because that's about all there is to Cyclozar. So tell me in the comments, if you had to use a Pokemon as your main source of transportation, who would it be? Huh? What the heck happened? Ah, so another one's here as well. Hey, he looked like me too, but beyond my primal comprehension. What the... What's going on? Okay, so there may have been a tiny bit of a teensy-weensy little paradox involving a coffee cup. Who's to blame? Who knows? What's important is now all Loxtons who happen to touch this coffee cup end up in this zone beyond time and space itself. Oh. There's more of me here? Yes, but that's not important. I gotta send you back. I'm just priming the quantum nihility machine, uh, which just takes so long to start up. You don't even know, so... So, so give me a bit. <laughs> uh, here, tell you what. Yeah, this should be enough for you to wrap up your video. Uh, okay, have fun, bye. Hey, wait! Yeah, he has no idea what he's doing. We've been here for, like, weeks. That... Sounds horrifying. Oh! Uh, horrifying is just a word you don't have to How he's so flat and bright! Oh! Well, I guess we can talk about Koridon and Miraidon. After all, they're Paradox Pokémon based on Cyclozar. And trust me, we're kinda experts on those now. The probably smartest thing we know now, besides how to solve this Rubik's Cube. So, the thing about Coridon and Miraidon is that they are the box art legendaries. And sure, all of Europe during the early centuries was obsessed with tales about dragons, but what made them so special to Iberia? Well... Honestly, not much. There's the occasional dragon here and there that pops up in folklore, some of which we'll get into in a bit, but really, they're surprisingly not that important to the culture in this particular region specifically. At least not any more so than the rest of Western Europe. Rather, the best I got here is that they could be inspired by the coat of arms for the House of Braganza, the Royal House of Portugal. It was one of the wealthiest and most influential houses in all of Iberia during the Renaissance period, and they had a major impact on world history. I mean, they popularized tea in Great Britain. If that doesn't kind of get the ball rolling for, like, the butterfly effect of today. But also, they founded the country of Brazil, no biggie or anything. And the super interesting part is that they're still standing as the royal family of Portugal to this day, over 581 years of existing. And no house is complete without its coat of arms. And the Braganza family sports a flag depicting a shield supported by two wyverns and a crown on top. The coat of arms has changed over time, and today the most common depictions are just of the shield, but they can't really seem to settle on just one design, as various coats of arms are used for different events, and the wyverns in the crown are historically just as important as the shield. I mean, take a look at the details on the scepter of Portugal, and even the Brazilian monument to their independence contains these symbols as well. Technically, Coridon and Miraidon aren't true wyverns, as they have all four limbs intact, but their connection to the crown is what sort of overwrites any doubt that this is where their dragon inspiration came from. In the Violet and Scarlet books, the final page of each shows a strange-looking egg thing with a crown on top. Very similar. 
and we now know that this is some sort of manifestation of Terrapagos, who theoretically is the controller and originator of all of the Paradox Pokémon shenanigans. So very important, and very fitting being the representative of not only this crown, but also the shield and the whole coat of arms being a turtle and all. And now, where do giant kingly lizards sleep? Oh no, this is a bad segue into a sponsor, isn't it? on extremely comfortable premium Helix mattresses built to fit their personal needs. Thanks to Helix's quick and easy online sleep quiz, they can recommend the perfect mattress to you and a partner. My wife and I got the Helix Midnight Lux like six years ago, and our sleep has never been better. I love the built-in cooling cover, which helps dissipate heat away from your body, so summers aren't as miserable. And you don't need to be miserable worrying about ordering a mattress online. Because not only do they ship it to you vacuum sealed in a box, so setup is easy, but they also give you a 100 night sleep trial to make sure you love it. And a 10 year warranty too, as they are built to last. Plus, they're 100% fiberglass free. Oh boy, that really shouldn't be an issue, but maybe you've seen those viral TikToks and news articles about various mattress companies getting sued over this. They're using dangerous fiberglass filler. It's really cheap for them, but it's terrible for your health and well-being, which is the opposite of what sleep should be. Because you spend a third of your life asleep, and the quality of the other two thirds is often directly tied into how well you spent that time sleeping. So a good mattress is a really good investment to your overall well-being. But it doesn't have to be expensive because they offer flexible financing options and I've got a deal for you. Visit helixsleep.com slash Loxton to get 20% off of your Helix mattress plus two free pillows and begin the process of evolving your sleep and elevating your quality of life. The link is just down there at the top of the description. Personally, I love Koraidon and Miraidon's names. Simple and cool at the same time. Korai and Mirai are Japanese for ancient and future, respectively, and that's how we first learned what the theme of Scarlet and Violet would be, past and future. Besides, you know, they're just looking at him. But that second part of the name, it sure sounds like Ride On, doesn't it? <coughs> no, not you, shoo. And Ride On is exactly what it means, because, yeah, you ride on them. But also, Raido is a Japanese pronunciation or transliteration of ride. So it definitely gets the transportation reference there. But the on suffix shares a different joint meaning. The obvious one is that it comes from Dragon, since that's the typing that the pair share. But also, we just discussed how Cyclozar is based on various species of lizards, and the largest of the lizards that it potentially pulls inspiration from is the Komodo dragon, Dragon. But the ride Don also doubles as Don is the Spanish word for king. You're definitely the king of the road while riding your beefed up Cyclozar around the region, but this king reference hits a little closer to home than you may think, especially for Koraidon. Something especially unique about these Pokemon is that they actually have two names each, and I don't mean language differences either. Being Paradox Pokémon, they have their Paradox Pokémon-like names too. Miraidon and Koraidon were also called Iron Serpent and Winged King. And voila! Enjoy taking in the Paldean scenery on the back of your past and future rideable Dragon Kings. If Cyclozar is the equivalent to a bicycle, Koraidon is like an early Honda One motorcycle, or even an old-fashioned chopper with its high handlebars. And Miraidon is a jet-powered futuristic motorbike, like the Light Cycle from Tron. I remember at first the legendaries being motorcycle lizards and the Pokemon centers being like gas stations was really odd, but I guess it starts to make sense when you consider Spain. First of all, the whole Iberian Peninsula is considered really good biking territory. Really, the northern side of the Mediterranean region as a whole is, both because the mountains and trails are great, and because the weather is rarely that cold, allowing for year-round mountain biking. In my research, I commonly found that Italy was considered the number one country for mountain biking in Europe, with Spain commonly following, though often at odds with southern France and southern Portugal. But then, also consider the more futuristic-looking superbikes used for bike racing. Moto GP is the International Superbike Grand Prix, and yes, it's headquartered in Madrid, Spain. And while anyone in the world can participate, the list of riders has almost always resembled the current one. Look at that. So much Italy, so much Spain. 
Spain loves their motorcycles. The country has the fourth highest motorcycle ownership per capita, and Spain's Barcelona is the number one city in the world for per capita motorcycles. Ooh, and I love how every travel option comes from a real lizard too. The climbing of course comes from several lizards that have long claws that let them rapidly climb rocks and trees, but geckos take it to the extreme. They have toe pads that are specialized to climb flat surfaces. The sprinting comes from many lizards as well, but especially black spiny-tailed iguanas, the fastest lizard, able to run up to 21 miles per hour, which may not seem that fast, but for its size? That's almost supersonic! And there's also basilisk lizards, who themselves often stand upright, explaining the Pokémon's bipedal stance as well. And they are the ones so fast and skilled that they can sprint across the surface of water. Speaking of which, swimming as well as they do comes from the marine iguana, and while most lizards are terrible at jumping, Anolis and the Agama lizard are exceptional at taking to the air. And finally, the flying can be explained by the skin flaps of the common flying dragon, though it too is only capable of glorified gliding. The only difference is this animal sports flaps of skin from its back, whereas the pair of Pokémon have head wings made of feathers and... Feathers 2.0 or something. Synthetic gliders. That's all true, but regardless, why are these head feathers here? I understand it's widely accepted now that dinosaurs had feathers, especially theropods. Those are the cool dinosaurs like the Velociraptor, and Corydon being an extra large ancient prehistoric lizard with a signature move called Collision Course, which could allude to the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Uh, yeah, it's got some dinosaur elements. Well, now that you mention it, I wonder if that's the same meteor that inspired the creation of Area Zero in the first place. Maybe the terrestrial crystals are shards from some massive meteor that hit Paldea in the past. Nope, nope, too big of a tangent. Save it for a future video. Okay, let's go back to the feathers. Even if they are just dinosaur feathers, isn't it a bit odd that there's such a focus on the head? From what we understand, this wasn't really a dinosaur thing, so surely it has to be from something else. Perhaps then, like headdresses? After all, Koridon is a king, perhaps like the chiefs of many Native Americans with their large feather headdresses. These headdresses were fashioned for their leaders with extravagant headwear made from various animal remains. But the one that sticks out the most of all is the one worn by Montezuma II of the Aztec Empire, said to have been decorated in beautiful green feathers plucked from Quetzal birds, and similarly to Koridon, this particular headdress has long dangly bits that go past the hips even. And if there's anything you know about Aztec history, it's probably that the Spanish, uh, ended it. And this Montezuma was their leader at the time, so there's a lot of involvement there. And hey, not to be insensitive or anything, but having a lot of feathers on your head and shoulders is often seen as a primal, tribal, or even savage or barbaric way of dressing mainly due to the beliefs of Europeans at the time of New World colonization. Like I get it, one or two feathers in the hat for fashion makes totally fine sense, but these savages, 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 they wear so many of them, it's like they want to be animals. So we'll treat them as such. And it's not just the people of the Americas either. Feather headdresses were common across the world, especially the further back you go. Ancient Egypt, ancient Babylon, ancient to modern Africa and the East Indies, and yes, even the literal Neanderthals of ancient Europe. It just so happens that the bulk of Eurasia moved past the need for using feathers so heavily. Thanks to heavily processed textiles becoming the hip new thing, using straight up animal parts became seen as peasantry, lesser, old fashioned, which of course eventually trickles down to contribute to the whole savages thing. Me not savage. Just uncontacted, not given chance, uneducated, unvaccinated. You me can get along. Um, it's can get along. Can get along what? Oh, oh, no, 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 me no swing that way. Frowned upon in Savage Land. Makes Sky upset. Hmm. Well, either way, big feather headdresses were and still are somewhat seen as ancient wear, especially for those with power like great warriors, chiefs, and emperors. So, of course, the king of the ancients, Koridon, needs some big feathers on the head. Especially in the style that also has those extra long dangly bits in the back. Like, take a look at this Lakota headdress. That's cool. 
and Spain took over their territory also. Same with where the Mayans lived, and the Mayan god Itzamna is a man and a lizard who invented the calendar, thus giving the ancient people time, and he also has some long danglies. Those look like they'd make some good handlebars. Tangent! While not inherently Spanish, the most famous motorcycle gang in the world are easily the Hell's Angels, whose logo depicts a skull with wings much like the flying Coridon. While founded in the US, they now operate in several countries, Spain being one of the early countries that they expanded to, again because of the motorcycle culture. This is the gang that started the majority of biker stereotypes that you can think of, but specifically the negative ones because they are generally bad people. And I don't just mean your typical bad, rowdy biker boy at a bar behavior, or the fact that most members are considered outlaws. I mean, even one of the higher ups was quoted in an interview saying, the club is not racist, but we have enough racist members that no black guy is going to get in it. If you're a motorcycle rider and you're white, you want to join the Hells Angels. Yeah. Yeah, they're that kind of biker gang. It's quite the contrast to the kind of biker gangs I'm sure Game Freak was actually referencing when designing these Pokémon. Rather, perhaps they were looking at bikers that are still tough and wear black leather and go out for rides together, but instead of playing bigots on bikes, shopping at Hobby Lobby for their big and manly SS Blue Line embroideries, they instead do things like save children from kidnapping, predators, and abusers, even being bodyguards for the kids in courthouses so that they feel brave enough to testify while their abuser is in the room. The kind of gang that gangs together to drive human trafficking semis off the road. The kind who help teach kids street safety. You know, technically outside the law at times, but seekers of justice for all. Either way. Which brings us to Koridon's fighting type and a major biker trope in Japanese media specifically. The bikers are the heroes. Think of literally every single common writer. Every single one for over 50 years. This is one of Japan's biggest franchises that never really got popular outside of Japan. But yes, it gets kids hooked on the idea of bike rider heroes from the get-go. Not to mention that motorcycle cops are pretty common in Japanese cities. And in the 90s, delinquent biker turns hero, or even just a motorcycle anime or manga with a hero, was a whole subgenre. Like Body Body Densetsu, the best episode of Golden Boy. Heck, GTO is still considered a masterpiece of anime to this day. And just think about that Akira scene. A scene so iconic that it's been referenced so many times, it has its own page on TV tropes, with Pikachu on the cover even. Moomin Rider from One Punch Man is a parody of the whole trope even. In a world of superheroes and supervillains, he's just some dude with decent bike skills and like, it's not even a motorbike, but he has such a powerful sense of justice. He works so well as a character because in Japanese pop culture, motorcycles and justice are inherently linked. And the genre has been coming back in recent years, or maybe it never really went away. But that could explain why we're getting these legendaries now. Bikers were a big part of the early Pokemon games already, and upon deciding that Iberia, one of the motorcycle capitals of the world, was going to be the next region, of course Game Freak wanted a motorcycle-inspired rideable Pokemon. And Coridon's fighting type works so well because of all of their tropey ideas about him. Quick refresher, while the dark type is often associated with villainous, bully Pokemon, the fighting type is often associated with justice and heroism, crime fighting, hence dark being weak against fighting. Justice always wins. We've got the sacred sword wielding three musketeers, the legendary heroes of Galar, the princess guard, the luchador, the white knight, the iconic Japanese hero Ultraman, and heck, even just the fact that most superheroes are extremely muscly and train a lot. Like, this isn't a 100% solid rule, but an association that's pretty common. I mean, why is Incineroar Dark Time? Because it's a heel wrestler, the actor wrestler who's a bad guy, while Halucha is the fighting type hero. And what about the fighting dark type Pangoro? Well, yeah, it's a delinquent, so dark type, but it's one that stands up to bullies, fighting to protect others with its own bully tactics. So, dark fighting. So the connections are just there. Thus, 
Oridon is fighting type. Okay, was that even a tangent? Don't know. But let's take a look at Miraidon now. Miraidon may have some specific origins specifically from Iberia. This is Culebra, or Cuelebre. Both names refer to the same mythical creature of Spanish folklore. It's described as an immortal winged serpent that guards treasure in a cave. Perhaps treasure like a time machine in Area Zero! And it's associated with thunder and electricity. Thus Miraidon's electric type. Hold on! You say Cobrabre was serpent, but that lizard with rocket boots, you lie? No, no, no lie. Remember, it's named Iron Serpent, and the arms and rocket boosters aren't truly a part of its body. It's basically wearing an exoskeleton or a highly advanced suit of armor. The real Pokemon is what's underneath and inside. An Iron Serpent with no limbs. Like this. Look at that snake. Isn't that amazing? Huh. So not lizard, really snake. Me hate snake! Pet dodo eaten by snake! Oh my gosh, that's so horrible. But, but no, no, don't worry. It's, it's not really a serpent. It, it is still a lizard. It's the, uh, oh, what's it called? The Iberian worm lizard. And as the name would suggest, it's just a really long, wiggly guy. Despite looking like a snake, it shares way more similarities with lizards, like a rounded tongue and external ear openings that put them comfortably into the lizard category. And Miraidon's color scheme definitely comes from the speckled worm lizard, which itself is native to South America, but come on, there's really no way it's not from this. Even its body pattern looks like glitchy pixels you'd see on a computer screen. It's a perfect fit. It's just a serpent who was gifted their legs back through the wonders of future technology. A real Cinderella story. Oh, you're talking about Miraidon. That thing has the most terrifying origins I've ever witnessed. Manga? Oh, don't worry about it. I finished the fix for the time paradox, so we can all go home now, and we never have to see each other ever again. No, hang on. You can't just drop a bombshell like that and leave me hanging. Yeah, I really would like to know what you're talking about. <sighs> Fine. Have you ever heard of an information hazard before? No. Ah, well. By definition, an info hazard is a risk that arises from the dissemination of information that may cause harm or enable some agent to cause harm. In uh, basic terms, it's something that's harmful just by hearing about it. Think like forbidden knowledge, complete eldritch sentences, or the names of Beetlejuice and Voldemort. Or duck mating habits. Okay, so it's just some fictional curse or something? Oh no, info hazards are very, very real. Mostly just government secrets they'd have to kill you for knowing and boring stuff like that, though. But that thing... If you knew what it actually was, you'd potentially be subjected to eternal torture. So, in the last episode, we discussed how all of the future Paradox Pokémon are part of the technological point of no return known as the Singularity, the point where robots will forever grow beyond human control. Well, today, the closest thing we have to that is the Internet, and that's where the final origins of Miraidon were born. In 2010, a user named Roko created a post on the Less Wrong community forums describing his idea for what the ultimate technology from the future could look like, and in various intellectual and academic communities, it has since been dubbed the scariest thought experiment ever conceived by some. The general concept of the post describes an AI agent that takes the form of a basilisk that is so advanced it virtually can do anything. But its specific purpose is to process the actions and thought processes of every human to ever exist. And based on this information, it uses its limitless capability to punish all of those who know of its existence, yet did not help bring it to reality. Even those who are long gone are not safe, as the basilisk is able to revive the dead. And with those last few sentences, that basilisk has now caught you in its gaze. It now knows of your existence, and forgetting about it isn't an option anymore, since you could have helped bring it into existence before then. And, as I warned you, there is no turning back now. Your only two options left are to hope and pray nobody ever brings it into existence, or 
to try and create it yourself. Miraidon certainly could be the Pokémon universe's interpretation of this AI. The Basilisk is a legendary reptile from Greek mythology, most often depicted as a snake, but occasionally more dragon-like in appearance. And it is an evil being that can paralyze and cause death to anybody just by looking into the eye of its victim. Besides, Iron Serpent being a bit on the nose, the Pokédex paints a clear picture to its true behavior. It resembles Cyclozar, but it is far more ruthless and powerful. The Iron Serpent is said to have turned the land to ash with its lightning. Yet, the player's Miraidon never behaves this way in-game, quite the opposite, honestly, acting as your personal taxi across the region and saving you from Professor Turo at the end of the game. Seems like a contradiction, until you assign it to the motivations of Roko's Basilisk. It's so kind to the player and their friends, because they are the ones who helped it. Because of you, it overcame its strongest opposition, itself. Because of you feeding it your Herba Mystica sandwiches, you were quite literally building it into its ultimate form. Because of you, everyone you knew and loved are dead. How are you so calm about this? Oh, don't get me wrong, I'm not qualified to build anything like that. In the future, I'm just a janitor. What do you think this visor's for? What? You not replace menial labor with robot yet? No, I need to make money. You haven't moved past capitalism yet? Eurasia has, but not the state. S state Singular? Singular. Uh, now let's get going. I programmed this button to fix everything. Nut. Ha ha ha, nut. Ah, well that saga's done now. Till the DLC comes out anyway. Maybe they'll add more paradoxes. But hey, what are your favorite paradox Pokemon? Did you miss our explanations of them all? Then click one of these somewhere around me to learn all about them. And until next time, never stop using your noggin. Can I leave now? I'm not gonna teleport into a, another paradox. Behold convenience of modern era. Huh. Not. <laughs> Not. <laughs> Ha 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 ha! Me not want go back. Not. <laughs>